Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be going through the whole of Edexcel GCSE Biology plants. So this is the first topic on the Paper 2 exam. If you'd like to follow along with this video, over on my website you can download my notes and flashcards. Okay, so photosynthesis is the way that plants make their food from sunlight. So hopefully you remember from B1 key concepts that in our plant cells we have these tiny green structures called chloroplasts and these are for photosynthesis. The way these work is that sunlight shines down onto the leaves and then the chloroplasts in the cells in the leaves use this light energy to turn carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. So the light energy is used to turn the reactants into the products. Now this is the word equation for photosynthesis but you also need to know the symbol equation. So that is CO2 plus H2O makes C6H12O6 plus O2. And then to balance this equation, you need to put a 6 in front of everything apart from the glucose. So 6 CO2 add 6 H2O makes C6 H2O6 and 6 O2. Now, when we said plants make food from sunlight, the food we're talking about is glucose. And glucose is really important for the plant because it's the starting point to make lots of things that the plant needs. Now, the glucose and oxygen can then be used in respiration. And glucose is this little molecule down here. Now photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction and this is because endothermic reactions take energy in. So the plant is taking light energy in from the sun. Now lots of different things can affect how fast or slow photosynthesis can happen and these things are called limiting factors. Now the temperature of the environment that the plant is in is a limiting factor. If the plant is too cold, the enzymes inside of it don't have enough energy to work. But in the same way, if the plant is too hot, the enzymes inside of it that control photosynthesis denature. So the plant needs to stay in this optimum temperature for photosynthesis to work its fastest. Now light is also a limiting factor. So if it's too dark and there's not enough light, photosynthesis can't happen. And this is because we need the light energy for photosynthesis to take place. So as the light intensity increases, so does the rate so it gets faster. However, you see the graph flattens out and this is because something else has become a limiting factor. We know that light isn't the only thing we need for photosynthesis to take place. So if something else runs out, photosynthesis will have to stop. The last limiting factor that you need to know about is carbon dioxide. And again, if there's not enough carbon dioxide, we don't have anything to turn into glucose and oxygen. So photosynthesis just can't happen. Just like the graph for the light intensity, as carbon dioxide concentration increases, we've got more of it to use, so it speeds up. However, just the same as the light graph, it flattens out because something else has become limiting. Now, the inverse square law is talking about the intensity of light as it gets further away. So I've drawn this diagram using squares. So, so here is the light source here. Let's say it's the sun. And this first square is a plant, and it's one meter away from the light source. So the light, all of the light is concentrated on this one meter square. So it's going to be really intense. However, as we get further away, let's say two meters, it's concentrated on these four squares because it's shining over more area. So it's less intense because we have the same amount of light over a larger area. Now, we can calculate the light intensity by dividing the light over the distance squared. So for now, let's just say the light is one and then the distance is x squared. Now, hopefully you know from maths that one over something squared is the inverse square. Now the reason it's squared is because if we use this diagram, it shows that it's three meters away. And this three meters shows that we have nine squares. And we know that three squared is nine. As something gets further away from the light source, the light has to spread over a larger area so the light is less intense. So we know that plants collect water with their roots, but once the plant has the water in its roots, it needs to transport it to the rest of the plant. And it does this using its xylem. And this is a tube within the plant that looks like this. And this is used to transport water. And the water throughout the xylem only moves up. So the water will only ever move in one direction. 
Now the cells in the xylem are really, really strange because they're completely dead. And this might be because if they were living and they were transporting water, they might try and use the water before it gets to the rest of the plant. Now, to make the xylem really effective, the cell walls which would have once been along here, break down. And this is just to make sure that the water can flow right through the tube without getting stuck. The xylem also has a substance called lignin, and this almost spirals along the edge of the tube just to keep it protected. If water's passing through it at really high pressure, we need to protect it so the tube doesn't burst. Now the process of transporting water is called transpiration. So, the water enters through the roots of the bottom through osmosis. So the water's moving from a high concentration in the soil outside of the plant to the low concentration inside the roots. Now you might be thinking that the roots do have a high concentration, so it's not osmosis. But don't get this confused, because the water doesn't stay in the roots, the water moves straight up. So the roots always have a low concentration of water. Now on the other page we just looked at the xylem, so we know that as soon as it goes from the roots, it starts moving up the plant through the xylem, and then to the leaves or the top of the flower where it's needed. And this is called a, tr a transpiration stream. So once the water's been used in the leaf, it exits through the different pores and holes. So this means the leaves need to draw more water up from the roots to use it again. So this constant pulling up from the soil creates a transpiration stream. So the water is always moving up the plant. Now, just like we looked at the factors that can affect photosynthesis, there are some factors that can affect transpiration. So how quickly the water is pulled up the plant. Now, if it's really warm, more transpiration is going to take place. And this is just because the water can easily evaporate. So as soon as it gets to the leaf, it's evaporating straight out. So the leaves just need to keep drawing more up from the soil to use it. Now, if it's really windy, this is also going to mean there's more transpiration as the wind is just pushing the water from off the leaves. So this means the plants need to draw up more water. And then if there is more light, there's also going to be more transpiration. And this is because the plants are going to be able to photosynthesize more. So they're going to need more water to carry out photosynthesis. So transpiration is going to happen a lot more when it's lighter. Now, we know that the xylem is used to transport water, but the phloem is used to transport sugars. And this is another tube within the plant. Now, unlike the xylem, the sugars in the plant can move in both directions. So it can move up and then back down. And this is because every single part, part of the plant needs to use the sugars. The roots need it, the leaves need it, and the flower at the top could need it. And another difference between the phloem and xylem is the fact that the phloem cells are living. Although they're only just about living, they need companion cells to keep them alive. So the reason that the cells in the phloem are only just about living is because they have no structures themselves. And they have no structures to make more of the sugars to be able to move through. So the companion cells next to them have lots and lots of structures, especially mitochondria, to provide enough energy to keep the cells in the phloem alive. Now, the cells in the phloem are called sieve cells, and this is because they do actually look like a sieve with these holes to allow the sugars to pass through. Now, the process of transporting sugars is called translocation. So, transpiration is transporting water, and translocation is transporting sugars. Now, in a plant, we have tiny little holes called stomata. And this is what allows the gases and the water to come in and out of the plant. So the stomata is literally just a hole. And next to the stomata, we have guard cells. And this controls how big the stomata is. If the guard cells are swelled up with water, they are open. And if all the water runs out of them and they are flaccid, they are closed. So you can see here in the closed diagram, they've gone so floppy that you cannot see the hole for the stomata. But when they're swelled up with water, we have this wide hole. Now, here is the cross-section of a leaf. And in a leaf, we have lots of specialised cells. Right at the top, we have the waxy cuticle. So sometimes, when you rub a leaf, you end up with a kind of sticky substance on your hands. And this is the waxy cuticle. This is there to protect the leaf. Now, right at the top, we have the upper epidermis, which is completely see-through to allow light through. And then right under this, we have palisade cells. And these are one of the most important types of cells in a plant. And this is because they have lots and lots and lots of chloroplasts. So right under the upper epidermis, in the top half of the leaf, we have these palisade cells which are packed with chloroplasts so they can do lots of photosynthesis. Underneath this, we have the spongy mesophyll. 
which is where all of the gases can move about in the plant. And then in the lower epidermis, we have the stomata and their guard cells. Now, plants have hormones to control their growth, and these hormones are called auxins. So you can see in this diagram over here, a plant having auxins at the top means that the plant grows. So auxins make the shoots of a plant grow. So this means shoots are positively phototropic. So this means the plant grows towards light. So auxins collect on the shady side of a plant. So you can see the light shining down here, all the auxins collect on the darker side. So auxins make shoots grow. So collecting on the bottom side means this side is gonna grow quicker and curve right round, which means it ends up growing up towards the light. However, they're negatively gravitropic. So this means they grow against gravity. So the gravity pushes all the auxins down to the bottom of the chute. So it collecting on the bottom side means the bottom side grows faster and again pushes it up. So this means that shoots will always grow up towards the sky. Now, we know that auxins help the shoots grow, but they actually stop the roots of the plant growing. So this means that the roots are negatively phototropic. So again, all of the auxins collect on the shady side of the root. However, if they stop the root growing, it means this side won't grow and the other side will be able to grow faster. So this ends up pushing it down. So this means it grows against the light. But they're positively gravitropic. So this means they grow with gravity. So again, the gravity pushes all the auxins down to the bottom of the root. So this means the bottom doesn't grow and the top can grow. So the top ends up pushing down and growing towards the ground. So it forces it down. Now, there are two other plant hormones that you need to know about. However, they don't control growth. The first are gibberellins. And these control seed germination. So when gibberellins are produced, the seed begins turning into a plant. Now, we can actually use gibberellins to help us produce fruit all year round. So different, different fruits and different flowers have different times of the year that they can grow. Some only germinate in the summer, some only germinate in the winter. However, if we harvest gibberellins and use them on the plants and fruit, it means that we grow and collect them all year round. Now, another hormone is ethene. And this controls the ripening of fruits. So again, we can use ethene to our advantage. If we collect unripe fruit and we begin transporting them, just before they get to the shops, we can give them a huge dose of ethene to make sure they're ripe, ready to sell. If this video helped with your biology revision, please subscribe to my channel and check out some of the other videos I have.